Hello everyone, my name is Francesca Table. I'm here in London and today we're going to be running through animation and generative AI. So what I'll be doing is I'll be running through some of the top tools that have been released over the past couple of years that have either AI or generative AI incorporated in those tools. So if you're an animator, this is a great way to start to automate your, your processes um, or if you're completely new to animation, these tools are going to allow you to create animation without even having to study and learn um, all of the, the technical sides of animation. So why would you want to know about animation? Why would you want to learn? So animation is a great way of telling a story. It's a great way of pre-visualizing a movie. If you are directing a movie or you are creating videos um, and you need to storyboard something, you might want to first create a pre-visualized animation to see that come to life. Um, or indeed, if you are in, say, music, you might want to create a cool music video. Or even if you're in sports, no matter what interest, industry you're in, personal branding and personal marketing is so important in today's age. And this can really help you develop your personal brand um, as well as telling a story of the brand or company that you represent or create a story in of itself, whether it's a film or a game or a metaverse. So without further ado, let's just dive in. So this is a bit of background on me. Um, so I really started off my career in the tech startup world, um, building out a social network like Facebook. I've worked with some incredible tech companies like Badoo, HelloFresh, um, and then during the COVID-19 era, moved into the metaverse games and NFT space, learned about blockchain. And at that stage, I was really trying to help IPs across music, sports and fashion to move into this space um, and explore these new 3D virtual worlds. Then I worked in motion capture, uh, which links very closely to animation. And then earlier this year, I launched the very first Gen AI Con, which is a conference around generative AI. Um, and that was focused on the creative industries. And today's event is all about animation in particular. Um, and I have a number of different communities within the generative AI space, mainly on Discord. Um, so we've got communities, we do lots of events, we do lots of uh, generative AI competitions. So it's a great way of learning and then putting those learnings into practice. So you might recognize some of these tools. We've got Kyber here, um, we've got Stable Diffusion, um, but some of these tools may be new to you. This isn't the, uh, these aren't the only animation tools that exist on the market, but it's a good starting point. Um, and I'm gonna try and create a logical flow for this to run through as many of these tools as possible. So let's start right at the beginning. And I think the beginning of animation is all around storytelling. And in order to tell a good story, you might have a couple of incredible storylines um, that you can start to work on. But if you've just got a seed of an idea and you need to elaborate more, you can either use a tool like ChatGPT to brainstorm um, ideas um, and help you evolve, or you can use a tool like StoryPath, which you can see an example of here, where you start with a premise and then you evolve the story. And then you can always backtrack if you think, okay, well, that seems a bit unrealistic. So in this example, we had, first of all, someone going for a picnic and then a UFO lands. Obviously there are alternative storylines that could uh, happen off the back of a picnic. Um, next, let's just dive into the world of images and video. Um, so the first technical term that's useful to understand is style transfer. So here is a fantastic example of style transfer. So you input an image or a video, um, and then you can essentially apply um, a style using computer vision to create an artistic render, whether it is 
um, a render which looks like a Picasso style painting or Van Gogh. Um, and style transfer is usually achieved using a type of neural network called convolutional neural network, CNN. So a CNN is trained on a large data set of images that can learn or recognize and extract features from images such as edges, textures, or colors. So in order to create this output, say a Van Gogh style, you first of all need a data set of Van Gogh's paintings. But the generative AI tool will not be able to create a Van Gogh style painting without first having all of those images in the data set. Okay, um, and so now I'll run on to the next. So here is a, a really good example of style transfer, and this is for turning your images and headshots into something that looks more like a cartoon. And you can see here, you might have um, cartoons which are similar to Pixar characters or Disney characters. You'll see a lot of similarities with you know, big eyes um, and similar facial features. One thing to be aware of though, is that cartoons can take away some of our distinctive facial features. So you have to be also careful in terms of um, diversity and inclusion to not start to whiten your skin and completely change your facial features because that, that will um, have the wrong sort of impact in the end. Another technical term is image to image interpolation. So if I just bring up this diagram. So as you can see, we've got Imagine a video is a set of different images. If you were to take out a couple of those images in between, you'd have a gap. So what image to image interpolation does is uses algorithms to find points and then decipher what is that the missing information here. Um, and a computer will therefore create um, what seems like the best bridge between those images. Um, so the primary goal of image to image interpolation is to create immediate images that represent a logical and smooth transition between two given images. This has application in animation, video editing, and even some advanced fields like medical imaging. So here are some examples where you can input images and then the tool will use image to image interpolation to create a video. So here's Genmo. And this style will be very much representative of the early days of generative AI. And I'm sure that we'll get far more advanced forms of image to image interpolation as time goes on. Another one is Kyber. Then we've got stable animation. Okay, um, next term is outpainting. So say you start with an image with a certain aspect ratio and you want to enlarge the image. Or um, for example, there are lots of videos that have been created that have been created for TV or have been created to be watched in YouTube. But actually a lot of people watch these videos on their mobile phone. Now people are going back into the archives of content and looking at how can they change the aspect ratio. And imagine, even if they haven't filmed or taken a photograph of the surrounding area, how can we use outpainting to enlarge um, that image or video? 
And here are some two different styles where we've taken girl with a pearl earring and imagined where was she? Um, so our painting uses a pro several steps in the process. Um, so first it has scene analysis. So the model analyzes the existing context of the image to understand the scene's context. This involves recognizing objects, textures, and patterns in the original image. Then content generation. The model generates a new content for the areas outside of the original image. This involves predicting what the scene might look like beyond the existing boundaries based on analyzed content. So here is a good example of um, outpainting with CapCut, which is one of ByteDance's um, technologies and tools. So we've actually got several different um, video features. So we've got local editing, we've got video magic mix, and then we've got video outpainting at the end. So you can see part of the, um, the image is cut out and then we managed to have full body shot. So now let's have a little look at image to 3D. So the first term that is useful to get acquainted with is photogrammetry. Um, and on the left, you can see photogrammetry, which was probably done with a drone. And it's really useful for architects or civil engineers to then render out a building um, as a 3D object. Or you can go into uh, smaller objects like a sculpture, a chair, um, do a photogrammetry of that object to create a 3D render, which you can then bring into um, a animation tool like Blender or bring it into a game engine like Unity or Unreal Engine. So let's quickly just run through how this process works. So photogrammetry is a technique used to measure and create 3D models of objects, scenes, or landscapes using photographs. The term is derived from the three words, Greek words, which are photos, light, grammar, a drawing, and metron, measure, which translates to measuring with light. So the first step is data capture. This involves capturing photographs of the subject from different angles using cameras mounted on various different platforms like tripods, drones, airplanes, or satellites. The more photos captured from different perspectives, the more accurate the 3D model will be. It is important to have a good overlap between adjacent images, typically around 60 to 80% for terrestrial objects and 80 to 90% for aerial objects. The next step is data processing. The captured photo photographs are then processed using specialized software. And the process involves several steps, image matching, bundle adjustment, and dense point cloud generation, surface reconstruction and texturing. And some of the use cases for this are surveying and mapping, architecture and construction, cultural heritage documentation, forensic and accident reconstruction, film and video games and environmental monitoring. The next term is a depth map. So, um, this is essentially a gradient of dark to light shades effectively creates a map of the depth of the third dimension in an image. Recent advancements like dual lens cameras and smartphone use depth maps to produce a portrait mode photos where the background is blurred to emphasize the subject. In essence, while a traditional image tells us about colors and shapes, an image depth map fills the crucial information about how far or close those elements are adding a layer of spatial understanding to the scene. At its core, an image represents visual information on a flat 2D plane. While the format captures colors and details, it doesn't inherently provide a sense of how objects in the image are spatially arranged in, re in relation to each other. This is where an image depth map comes into play. An image depth map is a representation that shows the distance of objects in an image from a specific viewpoint, typically the camera or a viewer's perspective. So in this case, you can see um, the areas close to the camera are lighter and the areas 
further away are darker. Um, the next is high dynamic range imaging, which is also known as HDRI. And what HDRI does effectively is it encodes more bits of data based on the color. So a low dynamic range would be around eight data bits of data per color, whereas an HDRI um, goes up to 32 bits of data per color channel. Uh, this enables the image to represent more detail and accurate lighting information, which can be important for applications such as 3D rendering, visual effects, and video games. HDRI can also be used to create a more realistic and visually pleasing photograph as it can capture details in the shadows and highlights that would otherwise be lost. However, HDRI images need to be tone mapped to convert them back to LDR images for display on standard screens or for printing. Tone mapping is a process of compressing the wide range of luminosity volumes in the HDRI images into smaller range that can be displayed on a standard screen or print. And the last one is 3D light filled images. So 3D light field images is a unique representation of visual information that captures both color and the direction of light rays in a scene. So if we go back to this, um, often a camera will mistake light for being closer up. So what a 3D light field image does is it also takes into account where light is coming from. So if I'm standing next to um, a window, it knows that that's where the light source is coming in from, and it's not a representation of me being closer to the camera. So with all of this um, together, we're starting to, to bring together the techniques that allow us to go from images to 3D. The last element is LiDAR, which is actually a form of laser, which is highly accurate even when there isn't light. So it's really good for being able to see in the dark with um, uh, night, night vision goggles, as well as for IoT applications, such as an autonomous vehicle, being able to understand the objects around it. And it means that even if there are dark conditions, the object still has computer vision using LiDAR technology. So let's bring all of these techniques together into some of these tools uh, and see what they have come up with. So Polycam is one. So on the left, you can see photogrammetry of a sphinx. And on the right, you can th see a 360 image that was taken um, that can then be brought into say Blender. Next, we have Luma AI, which again has photogrammetry on the left of a park bench. And on the right, we've got a walkthrough of a real estate property. And then we've got Avatar, which is photogrammetry, but of people in order to then create a photorealistic avatar. So there are avatar companies such as Ready Player Me, um, but that you only input one image into, whereas Avatar takes a multitude of different images as you scan your entire face and therefore creates a more realistic output. And next we have layer picks. And this for me is one of my favorite tools. Um, I will get to my favorite tool right at the end of this talk, but I really think that they have the trifecta of um, an amazing tool that can be used by creatives. They've got a social network where you can share your content, your content and find community online of other creatives. And then they also have the hardware to not only take the, the video footage using all of these new techniques, but also to showcase um, the work in 3D with these 3D kind of iPads. And I'll show you the whole video now.
Okay, there you have it. Um, next, we're going to go into speech. So if you have created an avatar, how do you get it to start moving its mouth and talking um, and becoming more of a sort of virtual assistant, uh, sales assistant, salesperson? Um, so here we go. Um, so the first term to run through is uh, speech to text, uh, text to speech synthesis. So here's a little workflow from the Google Cloud um, text to speech synthesis. Um, but there are multiple different workflows with Microsoft and other technology providers. So TTS synthesis is a process of converting written text into spoken speech. This is a technology is widely used in various applications such as assistive devices for visually impaired people, voice assistants, navigation systems, and many others. Here's how it generally works. So text processing, the input text is first processed and cleaned up. This involves removing or converting special characters, expanding abbreviations and converting numbers and symbols into words. For example, DR might be expanded to doctor, and the, less, the number five might be converted to the word five. Then we've got phonetic transcription. The process text is then converted into phonetic transcriptions, which are detailed representations of how the word should be pronounced. This may involve using a pronunciation dictionary or a machine learning model trained to convert text into phenomes, the smallest units of sound in a language. Then we've got prosody prediction. Prosody refers to the melody and rhythm of speech, including pitch, duration, intensity. The prosody pr uh, prediction model is used to estimate these parameters for the phonetic transcription. The model is trained on large data set of speech with animated prosody information. And then we've got waveform generation. The phonetic transcription and prosody parameters are then used to generate the audio waveform. There are several different methods for waveform generation, but most modern TTS systems use a variant of the WaveNet vocoder, which is a deep generative model that generates audio waveforms one sample at a time. And here are some examples. So we've got DID, Hi, I'm Dan. We've got Synthesia. What does it mean to be human? Where is the line between person and machine? Or does the line even exist? We've got hey Jen. Meet hey Jen on Canva. Generate engaging talking video for your designs in minutes. All you need to do is log into Canva and click on the app to create with HeyGen. First, choose an AI avatar that suits your company style. Next, craft a script that tells your brand story. Then, pick a voice that brings your story to life. Finally, throw videos into your Canva designs. The Met. And then we've got Yepic. Welcome to Yepic Studio, where your imagination comes to life through the power of AI. We're thrilled to have you join our creative community, where turning text into captivating videos is just a few clicks away. Next, let's move into another aspect of animation, which is movement. Um, 
so movement or is usually done with motion capture so computer vision is really important again to understand where objects are in relation to each other and then pose estimation this is really important for human motion so what pose estimation does is it's a vision it's a computer vision technique that involves determining the spatial positions of key points on an object, usually a person's body, in an image or video. The, these key points represent specific uh, body joints, such as elbows, knees, and wrists. The goal or pose estimation is to infer the pose or posture of the object accurately. Um, two main approaches to pose estimation are 2D pose estimation, um, and then we've got 3D pose estimation. 3D pose estimation is more complex and requires additional depth information, often achieved through multiple cameras or depth sensors. Machine learning and deep learning algorithms such as convolution neural networks, CNNs, have significantly advanced the accuracy and robustness of pose estimation systems. These algorithms learn to recognize patterns in images and can predict key point positions even in complex poses or challenging conditions. So if someone's wearing tight fitting clothing, that's fairly easy um, to do pose estimation. But if someone's wearing baggy clothes, all in the same color, it is very challenging. Um, so here's an example of 2D mocap. This is an open source project from Facebook Meta um, for animated drawings. And um, so essentially create animation starring your own drawn characters. This is an implementation of the algorithm described in the paper a method of automatically animating children's drawings of the human figure. Um, now you don't, this um, paper and this model can be used for other things apart from hand drawn drawings. It's being used for anime characters. It's being used for photographs of people. Um, but this is also a very fun application if you've got children. And then we've got 3D motion. So first we have deep motion. So they are building a motion intelligence platform for digital humans and virtual creatures powered by deep learning in the cloud. And here you can see full body tracking face tracking, hand tracking, rotoscope pose editor, an AI markerless motion capture, requiring no suits and no hardware. And it's free to try. And you can buy an avatar on Sketchfab and basically retarget your motion to any of these characters. And what's great about motion capture is you have more authentic human motion. So for example, if you're in the fashion world and you want a model that's walking on the catwalk, no model is gonna walk in the same way. They're gonna walk in time with the music, uh, maybe based on the brands, either they're more kind of romantic and floaty or more aggressive and, um, you know, masculine and um, in their walking style. Sometimes you'll have to do cleanup of the motion afterwards because it won't do it perfectly all the way through. But a lot of AI tools will help with the cleanup for you so you don't have to do it manually. Then we've got Plask AI. Very similar motion capture system. And here's an example of using pose estimation to actually create a pose in a generated image. All 
All right, then we've got Move Me. Now this is using just one um, camera and you can already see that the quality is not as good. If you look at um, the feet on the ground, they're sliding around all over the place. Sometimes they're hovering above the ground. Sometimes they'll be going through the ground. So to check the quality of your motion capture, it's great to look at the, the feet. And then we've got kinetics. So this video is showing how once you've created all of these motions, you can turn them into emotes. So you can package up the, the motion and then distribute it to different games and metaverses for people to buy those motions because those motions can be really, really useful for gameplay. And if you're a dancer, for example, and you've got a unique dance move or a choreography, again, you can capture those movements and start to monetize that. And in order to facilitate this, Kinetics have an SDK uh, that can be built into any of these metaverse or game platforms, and they've got an API as well. Now we move on to Cascader. Cascader is a standalone software for 3D keyframe animation of humanoid or other characters. So make, they make it incredibly easy to, to move things around manually. However, this is still fairly time consuming. As you can see, frame by frame, you're changing the, uh, the animation. So this isn't motion capture, you're just doing it, creating your own motion. And then we've got Crikey AI, which again, doesn't require motion capture. All you have to do is put a text prompt and then it will create the motion for you. And it will presumably recognize some already existing motion. They probably have a motion library behind the scenes that trains this. So you've got jumping jacks. Um, so the benefit of using a tool like this is it can really shorten the time to generate animation from five days to five minutes. So having done motion capture myself and knowing that you need to hire the equipment, the cameras, the tripods, find a venue, bring in an actor or a stunts person to do all of those motions and then um, pull out of the, the camera um, the motion to then retarget to a rig, this is a lot simpler. It won't be as realistic because it's all AI generated, but it's pretty close. Next, we move on to CGI and automated animation process. So this is what the animation process looks like. It goes from planning to modeling, to rendering, to post image production, video recording, and then the viewer can watch it. Um, and during the modeling phase, you're gonna look at 3D geometries, light, atmosphere, camera position, all of these different elements. Um, and many of these tools focus on one specific area However, there is one tool that is looking to automate the whole end-to-end -end process, and that's Wonder Dynamics. They say all great stories start with a sense of wonder. And what if bringing those stories to life wasn't limited by our resources, but only by our imagination? Welcome to Wonder Studio, where making movies with CGI is as simple as selecting your actor and assigning a character. It always seems to pause at that. The actor's performance cross cuts and automatically animates, lights, and composes the CG character directly into the scene. Whether it's one shot or a full sequence. Pause there. It's pretty impressive how you can bring in animation into essentially the, the real world. Um, 
Next, we have environment. So we've discussed um, avatars. Um, so now looking at setting the scene for the story. So a game environment um, is basically the virtual surroundings in which a video game is played. It encompasses all the visual, auditory, and interactive elements that constitute the game world. This includes the landscape, buildings, objects, characters, weather, lighting, and sound. Um, the game environment is created by a team of designers, artists, and programmers who work together to create a virtual world that is immersive, visually appealing, and supports the gameplay mechanics. This process often involves creating 3D models, textures, animations, and sound effects, and programming the interactive elements of the environment. Creating a game environment is a complex and time-consuming process, but is essential for creating an engaging and immersive gaming experience. And of course, tools like Unity and Unreal Engine that create these game environments can then be used for creating animation and film, music videos, um, and, and whatever other animations you have in mind. So let's look at some generative AI tools. So we've got Skybox. Let's see if I can play this. So Skybox Lab is a free research tool for creating panoramic scenery for artwork, games, and VR experiences. It offers a simple interface for generating skyboxes with various art styles, including fantasy landscapes, nebulae, and interior views. The tool generates high resolution images, but with some known issues such as seams and long term, non long generation time. This tool is licensed for perpetual non-exclusive use of generated imagery for commercial or non-commercial purposes. Next we have Opus AI. So Opus AI is an entertainment content creator and distributor dedicated to pushing the boundaries of what is possible in decentralized entertainment. Um, and what you can see here is on the left, you can see a text prompt um, input tool where you can input the environment that you're looking for, whether it's a rural environment or if it's in an urban environment and then on the right, it's automatically generating that for you. So you don't actually then need um, developers and, and artists and programmers to um, create that virtual world for you. So really, really incredible stuff. Next, we've got virtual production. So this is, again, if you are actually filming a movie sequence, um, virtual production really came online during COVID-19 when film directors and producers and actors couldn't go to exotic set locations around the world. They couldn't travel anymore. So they had to do films from within a studio and recreate those environments in a small space. And virtual production has really come in leaps and bounds. It has been used for exotic scenes like in, you know, film like the Avatar, Mandalorian, but now it's been used for also very generic places, even in inner city areas, which it might be expensive to get permission to film in those areas. So why not instead recreate it virtually? So virtual production is a filming process that incorporates digital technology and real-time visual effects and VFX into the production environment. It allows Filmmakers to capture complex scenes in a virtual environment, often blending real world practical sets and actors with computer generated environments, characters, and objects. So, this can be used for pre visualization. Pre visualization is essentially storyboarding or creating a rough computer animated version of a scene before actually um, shooting begins. This helps filmmakers plan camera angles, character movements, and other aspects of the scene before setting out onto the set. And then real-time visual effects. Traditional VFX are, are added in post-production after the principal photography is complete. And then we've got motion capture, which we discussed before, the LED screen, which you can see behind. These large LED screens or projectors are used to display the virtual environment on the set. And then you've got virtual cameras. These are digital cameras that exist within the virtual environment 
They allow the filmmakers to move and manipulate the camera in the virtual world in the same way they would in a physical set. Uh, and now let's discuss multi-plane camera. So this was first invented by Walt Disney for allowing a sense of perspective of, say you've got Mickey Mouse, which is out front, um, and then you've got the moon in the background. As the camera moves, uh, Mickey Mouse should move more, but the moon should move less because it's further away. So that sense of perspective adds to the depth of the scene. So the way they recreated it, or they created it originally, was using this very complicated contraption. Now, this is a different kind of drawing. It also came out of our school of self-improvement here at the studio. It is the blueprint of a piece of equipment designed to make cartoons more realistic and enjoyable. This is the plan for a super cartoon camera. We call it the multiplane camp. It was intended for use in our feature length cartoons. You see, we decided for features, the camera needed improvement too. Actually, the pre-feature cartoon camera was fairly simple in construction and operation and generally very satisfactory. Here, a Mickey Mouse short is being put on film. Mickey has been inked and painted on transparent sheets of celluloid. This happens to be a panorama effect where the character will walk in one place and the background keeps moving behind him to create the illusion. Each time a new cell of Mickey is photographed, the background must be moved a fraction of an inch. Photographing each one of these celluloids of Mickey and background makes a single frame of motion picture film. And here's how the action looks on the screen. Now note that our character is capable of giving us a real feeling of three dimensions. He can move farther away, and come closer. He can turn so that we see all sides of him. He seems to have roundness. There's nothing flat about him. He can almost poke his finger in your eye. But when he leaves, uh, <clears throat> When he leaves, when he leaves, whatever dimension he has given the scene leaves with him. Now, the unnatural flatness of the background becomes evident. But besides being merely unrealistic, the old fashioned flat background can also create a false effect. For instance, when our camera moves in closer on this moonlight scene, you'll notice that everything grows larger, including the moon. Now, when you walk along a country road toward the moon, it certainly doesn't grow larger like this, nor does it shrink in size when you walk away from it. The problem was how to take a painting and make it behave like a real piece of scenery under the camera. The trouble was we were photographing a flat two-dimensional background. So we set about making plans and blueprints for a new cartoon camera that would overcome this. The different elements in the scene were separated according to their varying distances from the viewer. This put the moon on a plane farthest away from the camera. With our original picture broken down in this manner, it is possible to control the relative speed with which each individual part of it moves to or away from the camera but the moon remains absolutely still. So there you have it. Um, that's the technique, the multi-plane camera. Um, and the reason why I show you that is because we still use that technique today. So this is Kubrick who creates virtual sets for virtual production. And what they do is they then create layers in exactly the same way um, to create that, that depth.
So these are environments that are created in stable diffusion, HDRI, so really, really large um, images. But as you can see there in front of you on the screen, they've created layers so that as the camera moves in that virtual production set, there's an element of um, three-dimensionality. So there you have it. Wonderful. So that's the end of my uh, presentation on animation and generative AI.